today's message is called The Perfect Gift. And I know that um, a lot of people give gifts at Christmas. And how many of you are searching for the perfect gift? Every year you search for just the right gift, the perfect gift. The one that is really going to convey to that person that receives it. I'm not talking about a joke gift, but I mean, you really want to, you spend some time thinking about it. You think about their personality. You think about what they, who they are, and you think about who you are. And gifts represent several things. First of all, when you give a gift, it represents your taste, your social uh, understanding, your social level, your economics, um, and your moral character. For example, if you're a, uh, if you're a moral, if you're a, a believer, you're not going to give somebody a bottle of whiskey for, for Christmas, but people, a lot of people do that. I mean, a lot of people in the world. But because we don't drink whiskey, you're not going to give whiskey. It, it represents your moral character. Um, it rep represents your taste. Um, I know that there are a lot of ugly sweaters out there, and a lot of people give ugly sweaters, right? That's the joke. You know, there's even some places that have an ugly sweater day. You wear your ugly sweater to work. Uh, but there are a lot of people that buy those things, and they don't think they're ugly. You know? We need to pray for them. They buy them because they like them. Have you ever received a really particularly ugly gift? I mean, a really bizarre, and, and, you, and you wonder about the person that gave it to you, like, what were they thinking? Because that gift is not, well, first of all, that gift represents them, but also, what, what do they think about me? Because that gift represents me if you're, they're giving it to you, right? So, um, also represents economic level because, you know, I don't watch much TV. I, I hardly ever watch TV, but um, occasionally, recently, there are a couple of channels that have Christmas movies on. So we'll, we'll go and watch a little Christmas movie. And they have these commercials that come up. And you know the commercial, this guy or this girl, they open up the front door, there's snow everywhere, and there's this brand new car with a bow on it. Have any of you ever gotten a brand new car for Christmas? Is there anybody alive that is? I mean, who, who writes this propaganda? Come on, now listen. If anybody's going to bring one to me and I'm going to have a big bow, Maserati, okay? For me, Maserati, can you do that for me? I'd like a really nice bow. And, and make sure the bow is coordinated with the color of the car. You know, like, not a red bow on a red car. You know, make sure it's a green bow on a red car or something like that, okay? But it does represent your economic status. You're not going to give something that is extremely expensive unless you have the wherewithal to do that or you're getting all your Christmas gifts by looting the way you know, they were doing a few months ago. Uh, the gift also represents the value and the importance of our relationship. The value and importance. If you don't value someone's relationship, you go to dollar store to buy their gifts. Right? I know you love, that's Pastor Mary Beth's store is dollar store. She values us. She just buys a lot of dollar gifts, you know, so... You get a lot of gifts. But um, really, it, it represents the value and the importance of your relationship. You're not going to, if, if you're in the, in the office, you're going to get somebody in the office something. You're not going to get them something suggestive. You're not going to get them something that intimates a closer relationship than you actually have. Christmas office parties are notorious for this, these kind of things going on. You're going to give something that's, you know, utilitarian or something, you know, because it's an office relationship. But yet, a family relationship, you're going to give something completely different. Uh, gifts also can be used to strengthen or restore relationships. To strengthen or restore a relationship. If you give a gift just out of nowhere. Um, I've told you recently, when I lived in Israel, I met a guy there from North Carolina, uh, Richard. He became the best man at my, at my wedding. He was an architect working in archaeology. I was an archaeologist working in archaeology. And we worked together on several sites. Well, um, we lost touch for a number of years uh, after you know, he was in our wedding and I, we attended his wedding. And we lost touch. And then it was reestablished. You know, the first thing both of us did without even consulting one another, that Christmas we sent each other gift boxes. To, you know, we were reestablishing that relationship. And now we talk probably every two, three months. We're on the phone. We talk and we visited he and his family. And, um, and so we, we have, we've reestablished that. And the gift giving is part of reestablishing a relationship. The perfect gift, so then, is value, motive, and need also. Because you don't want to give somebody that car if they don't need it. If they have a bunch of cars already, you give it to me rather than to them. You think about that. So uh, 
Value, motive, motive, why are you giving it? You're not, is it not an underhanded motive? You're not just trying to you know, get them on your side so you can use them. Value, motive, and need. Now, I don't know if in school, um, do you read literature like O. Henry anymore? Do you ever hear of O. Henry? Macbeth? Yeah. Um, we, read, we read Macbeth also. When I was in high school, we used to read a number of authors, and one of them was O. Henry. And there's a story. I haven't read it since I was in, in I don't know, it might have been grammar school. And it, was, it just fascinated me. Um, and it was called something about a Christmas gift. I don't remember what the name of it is. But it was all about uh, the turn of the century, the last century, the early 1900s. And there was a woman who had extremely beautiful, beautiful, long, luxurious hair. And she was married to a, a young man, and the young man, his prized possession was his pocket watch that he was his father's and had been his grandfather's. And so she saw, she saw a watch fob. In those days, you know, they'd wear the, the fob that would attach the watch. He just kept it in his pocket, but you'd have the fob that would be attached to it, and you could take it out and wouldn't lose it. It would be a little piece of jewelry there. And uh, she saw this was just perfect for his watch, and she couldn't afford it. And he saw some beautiful combs for her hair, beautiful, inlaid with ivory, and he just, but he couldn't afford. They were, and she saved and saved and saved, and he saved and saved and saved for months, but still couldn't, didn't have enough. So he decided he was going to sell his watch to get the combs for her. And so he sold his watch, and he bought the combs, and he couldn't wait to give her the combs. And she, likewise, couldn't wait to give him his gift. And um, he gave her the combs, and that's when she showed her hair, that she had cut her hair off to sell her hair and buy the, the watch fob. And he had sold his watch to buy the combs for her. So here are two gifts that are now useless. But what did they convey? They couldn't be used by either one. What did they convey? They conveyed the depth of their love the depth of their sacrifice, the depth of their feeling and the strengthening of that relationship. You would think that if someone gives you a worthless gift, that relationship isn't worth much. But in this case, that story was so poignant because it strengthened their relationship. Let's pick up in chapter two, Matthew two, verse one. Now, when Jesus was born in Bethlehem of Judea, in the days of Herod the king, behold, there came wise men from the east to Jerusalem saying, where is he that is born king of the Jews? For we have seen his star in the east and are come to worship him. All right, um, the wise men, interesting, interesting story. It's only recorded in the Gospel of Matthew. Herod, of course, we know we've talked a lot about Herod because I excavated everywhere Herod built, I excavated. And Herod was, he was king of the Jews, but he wasn't really Jewish. His father had been forced to uh, convert. And so he was Jewish by a father that converted, he was absolutely dedicated to keeping um, up appearances. And so he lavishly built the temple. It was the most fabulous temple since Solomon that they had in Israel. And he, he was responsible for that. It took 46 years to build it. And it was said that if you hadn't seen the temple in Jerusalem, you've never seen a, a beautiful building in your life. So it rivaled things like the Parthenon in Greece. And Herod, though, had not a clue where Messiah was going to be born. When Herod the king had heard these things, he was troubled, and all of Jerusalem with him. Well, if the king is troubled, and he's a maniac, and megalomaniac, and paranoid schizophrenic, you know that everybody around him is going to be troubled. When he had gathered all the chief priests and scribes of the people together, he demanded of them where the Messiah should be born. And they said to him, In Bethlehem of Judea, for thus it is written by the prophet, For thou, Bethlehem, in the land of Judah, are not least among the princes of Judah, for out of thee shall come a governor that shall rule my people Israel. Herod, when he had privately called the wise men, inquired of them diligently what time the star appeared. He sent them to Bethlehem and said, Go and search diligently for the young child. When you found him, bring me word again that I might come and worship him also. When they heard the king, they, de they, they departed, and the star, which they saw in the east, went before them till it came and stood over where the young child was. Now, in years past, I've done a number of messages on the star. This past Thursday, we talked about the light, fight for the light, and, and the story of Hanukkah. I'm not talking about that so much today. I don't want to focus too much on the wise men today, their origins, who they were, what they represent. 
I want to focus on their gifts today. When they saw the star, they rejoiced with exceeding great joy. When they were coming to the house, they saw the young child. Notice he's in a house now, no longer in the stable, and he's a young child, no longer a babe. So it's not all concurrent with the announcement to the shepherds and the visitation of the shepherds. They saw the young child with his mother, Mary, and fell down and worshipped him. Now, in the, in the East, worship is physical. Now, we worship, we lift hands to worship, or we sing to worship. In that time, you would prostrate to worship. You would face down throughout the Middle East, right straight up through the Middle Ages, face down worship. So they would prostrate themselves before a baby, which means they had some kind of a recognition. They recognized him in his infancy by what they knew before they departed. And they gave him gifts. They presented gold, frankincense, and myrrh. All right, let's just stop for, for moments. Um, what did I mention about gifts? Gold represents a social and an economic status, doesn't it? How many of you are giving gold for Christmas? Anybody going to give me gold for Christmas? I don't mean the gold gelt with the chocolate inside. I mean with the gold inside. Anybody giving me gold? Anybody give gold for Christmas? You give gold? Now you do see packages wrapped in nice gold paper. And generally you expect something nice inside if they use this beautiful gold paper. Um, there are gold, what is it called? Gold, not inlay, but when they put the gold foil on it. Uh, leaf, gold leaf. You can get something that's gold leaf. We watched. Uh, someone one time in Bethlehem actually um, gold leafing the chair that the patriarch was going to sit on on Christmas Eve and they, he was gold leafing the chair Fab, fascinating process to watch them do this I mean tissue thin layers of gold that he would he would brush on with a brush he had some kind of an adhesive on there it's pretty interesting anyway so social and economic status you don't give gold until, unless you've got gold you don't got gold unless you can afford to got gold to have it, right? You have to have some pretty strong economy. So what do we know about these wise men? We know that they were rich, they were wealthy. They were not homeless. They weren't wandering the desert. They weren't nomads wandering the desert. They had some, some wealth behind them. I've often spoken about the fact that they traveled probably about a thousand miles at their own expense. So worship is at our own expense. Worship is costly, and worship is giving something of wealth to us. What's wealth to us? It's giving to God. Now, it also, the gifts also, the frankincense, represented the value of the relationship. Where was frankincense found? Frankincense is the main ingredient of the incense on the altar. Now, yes, the traditional gold represents Jesus' kingship. Frankincense represents his priest, priestly ship, priest priesthood, and myrrh represents his sacrifice. That's the traditional. I want to speak to you in a little bit differently today. The frankincense is the value of relationship because if Jesus were not the one to put one hand on people and one hand on God, we would not have that bridge that our prayers would not be answered. He says, ask in my name. Whatsoever you ask in my name. When you pray, pray in my name. So he is that bridge, the incense on the altar in the evening sacrifice. The evening, they would go into the altar, the priest, and generally it was, it was shared. So one time a year, when we read about Zacharias, we studied him a couple of weeks ago. His one time in his life, he was able to go into the temple and share the incense, put the incense on the altar. He'd be the only one in there. He would put it on the altar, and the incense is made with various items, and one of them, the frankincense, is so that it would uh, have a beautiful fragrance. The myrrh, which is also in the incense, is there's much less of it. The myrrh is so that it would smoke. You had to have smoke because smoke rises. And what was happening? Outside, all the people were outside of the temple praying because the smoke rising represented prayers rising up before God. So everybody believed that that was the most opportune time to pray, that if they could get to the temple and pray during the time of the evening sacrifice, and the evening offering of incense, their prayers would be heard. Jesus represents that smoke rising up. 
that when we pray in his name, we come to the throne of grace boldly to receive grace and mercy in time of need. Also represents uh, the myrrh, a restoration of a relationship. The myrrh represents the restoration of the relationship between God and his people, both Jew and Gentile. Because Jesus is the Jewish Messiah, but came for all the nations of the world to come into the things of God, be root, grafted into the root of Israel. We serve the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. We don't serve Allah. We don't serve the God of Buddha. We serve the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. And so it's a restoration of relationship. Now, um, gold, frankincense, and myrrh are not unusual gifts. I want to give you a couple of instances. You don't need to turn, but if you're taking notes, 1 Kings 10, verse 1 and 2, when the queen of Sheba heard of the fame of Solomon concerning the name of the Lord, she came to prove him with hard questions, and she came to Jerusalem with a very great train of camels that brought spices and very much gold and precious stones. So this is what you would bring to kings. You would not bring the spices and the gold to just anybody. It was a tradition to bring them to kings throughout the Middle East. There's a story about Alexander the Great. I spoke about him on Thursday because that's why we had the Syrian Greeks even in Jerusalem in the first place. But Alexander the Great, he had quite a number of tutors. One tutor was Aristotle. Can you imagine having Aristotle as your teacher? <laughs> but he also had another tutor named Leonides. And Leonides was, along with a tutor, kind of an overseer of him. And one time he was burning frankincense as a sacrifice to the gods. Now, he served the gods of Greece, 12 Olympian gods. And Leonides uh, upbraided him, scolded him. This is, a, this is written in a history of, by Pliny. And uh, he told him that... You're, it's way too lavish. You should, frankincense is so expensive. Now, this is the son of the king, Philip, Philip, king of Macedonia. And his tutor saying, uh, you're living beyond your means. You should not be wasting this kind of money in sacrifice to the gods. And Alexander told him, this is a quote, there will be a time to worship the gods in a lavish manner. There will be a time to worship the gods in a lavish manner. Well, Alexander went on to conquer the known world at the time. He conquered Yemen and Saudi and all the other Gulf states, and that is where frankincense is grown and comes from. The first thing he did was filled an entire ship. This is a true story. With frankincense and sent it to his former tutor and said, worship without limit. Worship without limit and he was serving 12 Olympian gods that would cheat on each other and steal and kill and lie and deceive we are serving the living God who took our place can we worship without limit the perfect gift that we can give this Christmas is Jesus is there anyone in our life that doesn't know him? Start with family. If we are not giving Jesus to family members, we are doing a disservice to them. We have this gift, immeasurable, from God himself, and we can't share it? Never forget... One Christmas, I got a chemistry set. I was about, I don't know, eight, nine years old. Loved my chemistry set. And one, uh, I went to school, and uh, my younger sister, Peggy, she was five years younger than me, and so she wasn't in school yet. And I put my chemistry set up on the top shelf, but she managed to get it, and she mixed all her own chemicals up <laughs> and ruined my chemistry set. I think I was angry at her for about 35 years. <laughs> and no, I do not want a chemistry set. All of you evil people, I heard somebody thinking, that's what I'll get, Pastor Frank. I'll get a chemistry set. 
You get me a chemistry set, you got a fruitcake coming. <laughs> now, one of my fruitcakes, they're worth gold. <laughs> better than gold, let me tell you. Any fruitcake lover, one of my fruitcakes, better than gold. Right? I gave, I gave one to them, right? Better than gold? Good. I'll, I'll take that exchange. Give me the weight of the fruitcake in gold. We're good to go. Um, Jesus is the perfect gift. We've, we cannot allow, if we know God, we love God, how can we allow our family members not to know him? We've got to compel them to come in. Amen. Christmas Eve is a perfect time. You can bring him in. Just tell him, we're going to sing Christmas carols. We're going to light candles. We're going to celebrate Christmas. Bring him in and leave the rest to me, okay? Just bring him in. Get him in the door. Get him online. Leave the rest to me. I'll take care of him. It's a perfect opportunity. Everybody celebrates this time of year. Everyone wants to be happy and be joyful. Everybody wants to, to, to be around others and sing Christmas carols and rejoice. So, after the family, friends. Have you shared your faith with all your friends? Have we given that gift to our friends? Now, a lot of times, uh, people don't unwrap it. They don't bother to unwrap the gift, do they? You give them the gift, they just, it, it's so nice. I had that one time, my aunt, I had an aunt that died when I was really young, but before that, she used to give us the biggest Valentine thing, or Easter things, Easter things, yeah. It was uh, always chocolate. And she gave me this bulldog one time. Half white chocolate, half dark chocolate. See, we were integrated, Laverne, from a very young age. We were, uh, no, that wasn't that aunt. My other aunt told me this, and you've all heard this before, because um, she grew up in Tunisia. Because my, my grandfather, uh, quick story, my grandfather was uh, an orphan. He was actually the son of a Catholic priest. And so in those days, they didn't keep the child. The, the mother was a young girl in, her, in his church. So, no, I'm not carrying on the tradition, okay, just because we're in a church. So I, he, um, he put this child into an orphanage where they would raise the young boys to be priests. So my grandfather was destined to be a priest, but at the last minute he got cold feet, he left, and so he was drafted into the Italian Navy. So he became uh, a, a seaman in the Italian Navy. He hated it. So when the ship was docked in uh, Tunisia, he jumped ship, went AWOL, and Tunisia was occupied half by Italy and half by France in Italy. It was a death sentence to be AWOL. He was, he was a criminal. So he lived in French Tunisia, and he met my grandmother, who was from Messina in, in uh, Sicily, married. They lived in French Tunisia until a Frenchman started to blackmail him. So he then hightailed it to America. So he left my aunt and uncle with my grandmother in Tunisia. So my aunt, Aunt Lena, Lena, this tall, this wide, Aunt Lena, <laughs> She, uh, she asked my grandmother, how come, because in Tunisia there's black Africans and there were Arab Africans and there were white Europeans. She said, how come some people are white and some people are black? She said, they're all the same. It's just that some were born at night and some were born in the daylight. <laughs> so that's been our family tradition ever since. Anyway, now why was I telling that? I told that because I was telling another story. What was the other story? The other story is about Aunt Edith. That was Aunt Edith. So I needed to get me this bulldog. It was about this big. I mean, as a little child, maybe seven or eight year old, it seemed like that big. It might have been, I don't know. It was about that big. Anyway, it was a perfect bulldog. I mean, it looked real, but it was chocolate. So I put it up on a shelf, and it was just so nice, I didn't want to eat it. I didn't want to break it. It was just so special. I didn't want to eat it. I wanted the chocolate, but I didn't want to mess up this beautiful thing. And so... Uh, I don't know, it sat up on that shelf for years. And finally, one day, I, I said, what happened to the bulldog? My mother said, it's so old, I threw it out. You know? <laughs> That's what happens. If you give somebody this gift, they don't unwrap it. They lose it. If they don't use it, they lose it. So after you've moved on to your friends, compelling them to come in, just say, just do me a favor. You want to give me something for Christmas? Come to church with me. Want to give me something for Christmas? Come online to church with me. Just come to my house and you see what my church is like. Then you move on to your coworkers. Your coworkers and people that you may see. Do you, does anybody give a little gift to people? Like they're your mail carrier uh, or your, there's a, there are a couple of people that I like to give 
a, a card with some money. There are a couple of, um, in a parking lot up in D.C., there are a couple of ladies that work this parking lot, and they are, and it's, it's at the store that got looted. You know, the store I've told you, four, four blocks from the house there got looted back in May. And these two ladies are from uh, Ethiopia. Ethiopia. And they are the sweetest ladies. Everybody that works there is from Ethiopia. They're the sweetest ladies. So, and they're always so friendly. And so at Christmas comes, I give them each you know, a card with $5 in it just to bless them because they're, they sit in this little booth all day long, every day, and they check to make sure you have a uh, uh, valid. valid, thank you. You see, validation. That's why I have Pastor Mary Beth around. She completes my sentences for me. Thank you so much. Here, I'll just move my mouth and you do the words. <laughs> Put your mic on, though. <laughs> I'm getting to that age where I'm drooling now, too. I don't know. <laughs> so, uh, anyway, you probably have people like that. Have you shared with them? Share something more than $5. Share something that'll change their lives for eternity. This gift of God, the perfect gift, Jesus, it shows his taste and his status. Is that where we started? Number one, a gift represents a giver's taste, social, economic status, or moral status. He gave his best, his only begotten son. It shows the status of God. What did I say, number two? A gift represents value, the value and importance of a relationship. Well, would you say he values our relationship? Would you say... He wants to have a relationship with us if he gave Jesus. And then the third thing I said, it strengthens or restores a relationship. Would you say that Jesus has restored our relationship to God? Look, I knew, I know who I was before I got saved. I would not have liked any of you. I would have blown you all off. None of you. I was that kind of person. I was into myself. And doing my own thing. I could care less about anybody else. I was on a career path. I was working for the Hebrew University in Jerusalem and other times for the Department of Antiquities of Israel. I was rising in my field. I was using people. Not in archaeology. It's pretty hard to use people in archaeology. But in socially using people to get what I wanted. To be who I wanted. And yet... Every breakthrough I had, every check off my list, did not make me happy. I wasn't content. Something was missing. I, at one point, was so depressed, I moved into a tent with a Bedouin family and lived for four months in the desert with a Bedouin family because I couldn't trust myself in society too many temptations, and I'm, I'm living in Jerusalem, so I mean, think of that. Too many temptations in Jerusalem. So I live in the desert with the Bedouin. If there's one place there's no temptation, it's the Bedouin, because I mean, you step out of line, they slit your throat. So that's a pretty good incentive. <laughs> Not to mess around. So it, it was wonderful. I learned the ways, of the, the, the Bedouin used to say that, enter Bedouin and Hunfog. You're a Bedouin from here up. <laughs> and I learned Arabic spoken Arabic Arabic from the desert if I speak it anywhere they say where have you been <laughs> because I don't speak an Egyptian dialect or a, a Maghreb, um, Moroccan dialect I speak a desert dialect from the Bedouin and they recognize it the Bedouin by the way to the, to the rest of the Arab world represents their heroic past they look upon the Bedouin as their past and they'd love to be like them, but they don't want to give up their houses and their cars and their radios and televisions and all that, computers. So I didn't find contentment, peace, joy until I found that I could have a relationship with God. I was raised in the church. I went to church all the time. But I didn't have a relationship. I didn't know about being born again. I didn't know that I could know God through Jesus. 
I knew about Jesus. I knew about Christmas. I knew about Easter. I knew about all those things. I knew that he died and was resurrected, but I never asked him into my heart. I never accepted resurrection life or was transformed by his presence. I never thought of walking by faith or walking in the spirit or serving him in any way. And then when I'm in that, in Jerusalem, in a church, a Baptist church in Jerusalem, a charismatic Baptist church, which in itself is a miracle. And the, the man is talking, is a missionary talking about someone being raised from the dead. And I'm like, oh, I'm out of here now. No way. I mean, they're telling these weird stories now. This is what I expect churches to do. Lie to you. And you probably have friends that think that. And so before the man finished his message, he said, let me ask you a question. Maybe you've never heard of a miracle like this. Let me ask you, do you believe Jesus is alive? And I thought, well, sure, I've always believed he's alive. So he said, not to me, but to everybody, if you said yes, what do you think he's doing right now? What do you think he's doing right now at this very moment? And that completely stumped me. I didn't have a clue. Every picture drawing I ever saw Jesus was back in Bible days. I never saw a modern depiction of Jesus, so I didn't have any context to what he's doing right now. But if he's alive, he's got to be doing something, right? He's got to be. If he's alive, he's not just back in history. He's now. He's current. And the man followed that up by saying, well, the Bible says he's the same yesterday, today, and forever, which means he's doing the same things he was doing in Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. <laughs> Healing the sick. Raising the dead, casting out devils. I was out of my seat before I knew what was happening, giving my life to the Lord. Changed me. Next month, January, it will be 15 years that I lay in a hospital. 15 years ago, Sibley Hospital in Washington, D.C. Surgeons said, you have a very serious, very advanced stage of cancer that we cannot remove. The only hope we have of keeping you alive is massive radiation and massive chemotherapy, but you're too weak. We've got to stabilize you. That night, the gift of God spoke. Because I had accepted him years ago in the hills of Jerusalem. And he spoke and said, you shall live and not die and declare the wonderful works of God. For I've sent my word and healed you and delivered you from all destruction. He chose two scriptures, both out of the book of Psalms. And I knew I had my miracle. I didn't feel anything. I was still very weak, in tremendous pain, very sick. But I knew I had my miracle. That was a Monday. Tuesday and Wednesday, surgeons shuttling in and out, trying to stabilize me so they could begin treatment. I was introduced to a radiation doctor. Thursday morning, they all walk in together and say this. There's been a remarkable turn of events. We have some very, very good news for you. The cancer is no longer in your body. You are cancer free. The next day I was released from the hospital. That is a gift of God. That is Jesus, our healer. Jesus, our shepherd. Jesus, the one who is dead but alive forevermore. Jesus, our personal redeemer, paid the price in his own blood, shed his blood, forgave us, didn't just atone, forgave us. Our sin is as far away as east is from west, the Bible says. North, south is finite. You go north, eventually you're going to go south. You go east, you're never going to go west going east. You may come back to the same spot you started, but you're still going east. It's infinite. That's what he said. Our sin is as far away as east is from west. So today, you have the ability to purchase the perfect gift for free.